All right, everyone, welcome to part two of lecture 6-1. This will cover the larynx, and I'm going to try to do it all in one push. Uh, so this will just be a two-part uh, lecture for 6-1. So uh, first of all, of course, our respiratory tract is divided into an upper and a lower respiratory tract. And uh, that division happens at about the um, uh, T6 or so of the vertebral column. Um, below the cricoid cartilage, well below the cricoid cartilage. The lower respiratory tract includes the trachea and the bronchial tree and, of course, the lungs. Uh, so here again, uh, a refresher on that mid-sagittal bisection of the head where we see uh, the oropharynx going down into the laryngopharynx at the landmark of the epiglottis. We have the additus opening into the uh, the laryngeal, the um, voice box, the larynx, and we can see those vocal folds here. Uh, so another landmark is going to be the cricoid cartilage anterior to uh, the vocal folds, and that cricoid cartilage forms that bump on the neck, uh, you know, colloquially called the Adam's apple. Uh, below that, we can see the uh, tracheal rings, uh, the rings of the trachea, and we've got the uh, signet portion of the cricoid cartilage uh, posterior here above those um, those uh, cartilaginous rings. Uh, so this is the portion we're going to be focusing on on this video. So the larynx, of course, the pass. So this is the anterior view of the larynx with the thyroid cartilage here, hyoid bone above it, and the epiglottis sticking up. Uh, so passageway for air. Also, uh, the organ of phonation, the voice box, is the larynx. So the larynx is composed of nine cartilages total. There are three unpaired, which are shown in this slide, and there are three paired cartilages. And all of these are important for coordinating the movement of the uh, vocal cords, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the uh, thyroid cartilage, of course, the, the larger one, the Adam's apple, uh, below that, we have the cricoid cartilage. Uh, cricoid cartilage is a, a signet shape, like a ring, a ring that has a, like a, a Super Bowl ring or a, your high school class ring, which is uh, large on the one side and narrow on the bottom on the other underside of your finger. So uh, that cricoid cartilage located around, um, you know, C6, C4 region, uh, depending on the, you know, the elevation of it. And above that, uh, we have the epiglottis. Uh, so already mentioned that. Epiglottis is actually anchored to the tongue by uh, several uh, folds of connective tissue, a medial and a lateral glossoepiglottic fold. Uh, so again, remember, during that swallowing phase, the epiglottis is the flap that covers the additus so that food doesn't uh, fall into the airway uh, during swallowing. Uh, so here's the posterior view of the uh, larynx. And now we're seeing the other three paired cartilages, so six in total, one on each side. We have the arytenoid cartilage uh, here, which is a large kind of L-shaped. Uh, it has an apex, and then it has its base has two portions uh, traveling off. It has a, a muscular process and a vocal process here. Actually, this, this is probably better uh, looking like that. So it has a vocal process, a muscular process, and then uh, upwards is the apex. <clears throat> on top of the arytenoid cartilage is the crown on top of uh, that, the corniculate cartilages. Uh, they are um, embedded in connective tissue. Uh, along with the cuneiforms, which are not shown here. Uh, they are, uh, so the um, areopiglottic fold attaches to the corniculate cartilage and uh, around to the side of the, um, the additus. And contained within that cartilage uh, is these two cuneiform cartilages. Uh, contained within that connective tissue is the two cuneiform cartilages. So here is a top-down view of an isolated tongue and uh, larynx. You can see the uh, glossoepiglottic folds, and you can see the areopiglottic folds around the side, uh, attaching kind of to the epiglottis. 
So the corniculate cartilages here in green, closer to the midline and more inferior, are resting on top of the, um, the, uh, uh, um, the uh, retinoid cartilage. The cuneiform cartilage is embedded in this areopiglottic fold, uh, embedded in that uh, connective tissue. So it's not actually attached to the arytenoid cartilage itself. <clears throat> so between these cartilages are going to be layers of membrane. We have the thyrohyoid membrane from the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone, and we have the cricothyroid membrane between the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid uh, ligament. Piercing the uh, thyrohyoid membrane is going to be the... Um, uh, the internal laryngeal uh, nerve and artery to supply the superior portion of the larynx above the vocal folds. So now this is again that top-down drawing. Anterior is up. You can see the uh, uh, middle uh, uh, glossoepiglottic fold here. And so this is this uh, view doesn't it, the drawing doesn't have the depth. But this is uh, has this structure has depth to it. This orange is higher than the yellow, and the orange actually forms false vocal folds, a, a, a vestibular flap of um, uh, connective tissue. The true vocal folds are below that here in yellow, and they form a very tight line uh, formed by the. Uh, vocal ligament and the vocalis muscle, which we'll learn about in a minute. Between the true vocal folds is an opening called the rima uh, glottis, or glottidis, sorry, the rima glottidis. So that's the opening into the, um, the, uh, the larynx, into the, um, the trachea, I should say. So here from this lateral view, we can see the false vocal folds, lateral view and posterior view. Uh, we can see the false vocal folds and the true vocal folds below that. You can also see from this uh, middle view the, um, the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages in the area epiglottic fold right there. Uh, so this is an actual uh, view. You can follow the YouTube video. Uh, and see, uh, no, I don't want to do this. Uh, so you can actually follow this link uh, and see this YouTube video uh, showing you the movement of the true vocal folds and the false vocal folds, which are, they don't move, and the areopiglottic membrane. But uh, so uh, this laryngoscope, uh, usually through the nasal cavity, uh, can be done, you know, if you have a laryngoscope, you can do it to yourself and take a nice video of your vocal folds moving. So we'll look at this laryngoscopic view a few times in this lecture, but uh, you can see this view in motion uh, at different types of phonation, so you can see the vocal folds moving. Uh, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> okay, so the larynx, uh, there are spaces or compartments above the um, between the attitus and the false vocal folds is a region called the vestibule. So that's just the space uh, between those two structures, the, the opening. Uh, then uh, below uh, the false vocal folds is called the ventricle. Uh, the ventricle is you know, just like in the heart. It's basically the passageway into something. So this is the ventricle. Uh, into the uh, trachea. Uh, and then uh, between the true vocal folds, we have the rima glottidis, which is the actual opening. Uh, so the ventricle is like the chamber that leads to the opening. And the um, uh, rima glottidis is the opening itself, the doorway. Then below that, we have the infraglottic cavity below the uh, true vocal cords, the true vocal folds. Uh, and that's around the cricoid cartilage. So at the level of the cricoid cartilage, you have the infraglottic cavity. So um, the, the wall of these structures, the surface uh, that, that forms the, the walls of these spaces, has uh, names too. Of course, we've got the areopiglottic fold uh, forming the attitus. 
the quadrangular membrane is the wall of the, uh, the uh, vestibule. Uh, then we have the ventricles here between the folds. We have the cricothyroid membrane uh, between the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage uh, in the infraglottic space. <clears throat> so we, we already talked about the extrinsic muscles of the larynx when we talked about the neck. And so this is a reminder of those muscles which also serve uh, in um, elevation and uh, some movements uh, during swallowing and, and phonation, respiration to open up the, uh, the additus and the vocal cords. So now let's learn about the intrinsic muscles uh, of the larynx. These are the ones that will actually uh, actuate the uh, the arytenoid cartilage to cause its rotation or movement to change how the uh, vocal ligament on the additus uh, moves. So the, the uh, arytenoid cartilage is going to rotate internally or externally based on the uh, movement of these intrinsic muscles and that will open or close the vocal cords, changing the pitch and the amount of airflow. So um, <clears throat> here we go. So uh, to take a look at the vocal cords themselves first. So we have the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage posterior. Here is that arytenoid cartilage with the corniculate cartilage on top of it. Attaching from the vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage is the vocal ligament. The vocal ligament. Uh, so that vocal ligament is what uh, forms the rima glottidis and opens the vocal uh, opening or closes the vocal opening, the vocal cords. So this vocal ligament is the vocal cords. So now let's talk about these muscles and how they're attached and what movements they perform on the uh, vocal cords, on the vocal ligament, and on the arytenoid cartilage. So uh, you, this is where um, you're going to have to pay attention because uh, one person might be talking about the movement of the arytenoid cartilage and one person might be talking about the movement of the vocal cord and those things might be different. So especially on exams, you know, this can be a tricky uh, point of contention. So make sure you know what it is you're talking about uh, in groups or what the exam question is asking before you answer it. So the first muscle we're going to talk about is the lateral cricoarytenoid attached to the cricoid cartilage and the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage. So cricoarytenoid and it's on the lateral side so uh, too easy. This uh, vocal cord is going to cause the um, closing, uh, this uh, muscle is going to cause the closing of the vocal cords via internal rotation of the arytenoid cartilage. See how the arytenoid cartilages are internally rotating, uh, causing the vocal process to come together and close the vocal cords. So now let's talk about the transverse and oblique, uh, so transverse in, pointed out in red, oblique in uh, black here. Uh, these are the arytenoids, the oblique and transverse arytenoid muscles. So in the dissection, you can't actually distinguish between these two muscles. It's not worth it, but they are slightly different. However, both of them cause uh, the adduction a deduction of the arytenoid cartilages and the vocal folds. So this actually, from the posterior where my wrists are, it pulls the arytenoid cartilages together. So it's not doing much in the way of rotation. It's actually pulling them together so that the vocal cords are closer together. So this is another way, uh, a different way to uh, adduct the vocal cords to close the rima glottidis by adducting the arytenoid cartilage. In the last one, we were, uh, we were internally rotating the arytenoid cartilage. We were not adducting the arytenoid cartilages to close the rima glottidis. Now the 
posterior cricoarytenoid attached to the signet portion on the posterior side of the cricoid cartilage and then to the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage as we can see here. And what's this, what this is going to do is it's going to uh, externally rotate externally rotate the arytenoid cartilages so that the vocal cords, I can't do it with my fingers, I'm not double jointed, the vocal cords open up. And you can see that opening up, which is an abduction, abduction of the vocal ligaments. So here, the external rotation is causing abduction of the vocal ligaments. And this is the only laryngeal muscle uh, that abducts the uh, vocal ligaments. <clears throat> now, um, so the, uh, we're, we've got a couple more uh, muscles here. Uh, the thyroarytenoid is going to uh, narrow the vestibule where the false vocal cords are. So um, uh, not very important here, but on the inferior portion in blue, we can see the vocalis muscle. And the vocalis muscle travels with the um, vocal ligament. And so vocalis muscle can tense that ligament so it's taut. Instead of loose, it can be taut. As air passes through, that makes the vibrations faster, increases the pitch of the air as it's traveling past the vocal ligaments. Another way to increase the pitch is the uh, cricothyroid muscle and attaching anteriorly to the cricoid and then uh, heading posteriorly on the lateral side to the thyroid. And what this does is it flexes uh, anteriorly the cricoid cartilage. So this is flexing that joint. Uh, and by so doing, the arytenoid cartilages don't move, but the vocal, the vocal ligament uh, stretches, gets stretched as that uh, thyroid cartilage moves down and forward. So that lengthens that, raises the pitch again. So there are some other features of our skull, our face, that contribute to the timbre of our voice, the pitch and, and the tone of our voice. And uh, these are the sinuses. So the sinuses are important mainly because they lighten the skull and also because they increase surface area for um, mucosal secretions, including the uh, immune factors, the cytokines and, and immune cells. But uh, these also uh, serve as resonant chambers, like the inside of an acoustic guitar. They serve as resonant chambers to change the tone of our voice. If we didn't have these, our voice would sound very different because air doesn't pass through the openings to these uh, sinus cavities. Uh, and so for that reason, that air passing, uh, like blowing air across the top of a bottle, whoo, makes that deep noise. Air blowing past the openings to the sinus cavities gives our voice a completely different tone as well. So just an interesting aspect of that. Now let's look at the innervation of these intrinsic muscles. So the extrinsic, we were talking about the ansa cervicalis. Intrinsic muscles, we're talking about vagus nerve. So all of these intrinsic muscles are innervated by vagus nerve, but they're innervated through different branches. We have the uh, superior uh, laryngeal nerve, uh, which branches uh, uh, before passing through the thyrohyoid membrane. Uh, at that branching point, it becomes an internal and an external laryngeal nerve. Uh, <clears throat> so we can see, so this whole diagram is vagus nerve isolated in the tracheal stalk and, and the aorta here and down into the esophagus. So, uh, there is the superior laryngeal nerve branching from vagus. So uh, that superior laryngeal nerve has uh, GSA and SVE fibers in it. The internal laryngeal nerve branches and travels through the uh, thyrohyoid membrane. The external laryngeal nerve um, branches and travels inferiorly to the cricothyroid muscle. 
<clears throat> so we can see that here where that branching has occurred. We have the internal portion traveling uh, above the vocal fold to the portions above the vocal fold. Uh, we have the external laryngeal nerve traveling to cricothyroid uh, muscle. And here we can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve traveling behind uh, uh, the, um, the articular process of the uh, cricoid cartilage where the thyroid uh, cartilage and the cricoid cartilage articulate behind that process to innervate below the vocal fold. Uh, so we see all those being pointed out by those arrows here. So the, this, is, this is the way to you know, categorize things. Internal laryngeal nerve only does sensory. It only has GSAs. That internal laryngeal nerve only does GSAs. And it's doing GSA sensation above the vocal folds. The external laryngeal nerve, which branches from it, is only doing SVAs to one muscle, the cricothyroid muscle. The recurrent laryngeal nerve travels down with vagus nerve into the thorax, into the mediastinum, uh, travels around below the arch of the aorta on the left side and uh, around the um, uh, brachiocephalic artery on the right side and then reascends along the, um, uh, the laryngeal cartilages to enter the inferior portion of the vocal folds of the vocal cords. And this recurrent laryngeal nerve innervates all of the other intrinsic muscles we talked about, except for that cricothyroid muscle, which is innervated by the external laryngeal nerve. The recurrent laryngeal also does uh, GSAs, uh, also does GSAs to the uh, portion below the vocal folds. So recurrent laryngeal has SVAs and GSAs in it. And here highlighting those, so you can see uh, highlighted, uh, pointed at with these black arrow tips is the recurrent laryngeal nerve on each side, which takes a slightly different path on each side. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, why it takes the circuitous route to get into the vocal cords. Uh, why does this uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve have to travel into the thorax before traveling back up uh, to the vocal cords? And this is a result of uh, some idiosyncrasies that uh, happen during development. Uh, the laryngeal nerve uh, coming from the sixth uh, pharyngeal arch actually uh, is being developed, is undergoing development below the arch of the aorta and gets pulled down uh, as our, our embryo lengthens. And so it's an interesting process. And so um, if you've ever heard, so have any of you heard a giraffe uh, vocalize? And the answer is no. You go to a, a zoo, giraffes, you don't hear them, you know, making, they don't moo. And you don't hear giraffes from like miles away mooing in a field. Uh, giraffes, because their long neck, their current laryngeal nerve travels meters down into their thorax uh, loops around their uh, aortic arch and travels all the way back up. So giraffes, because of the length of their recurrent laryngeal nerve, cannot uh, finally uh, contract their laryngeal muscles. So they can't vocalize the way uh, we can or other animals can. And that's why giraffes will never rule the world. So every animal has a reason why it can't rule the world. Uh, we talked about dolphins and their lack of thumbs. Giraffes, it's because of their long necks. They won't be able to, they just can't talk, and so they can't organize themselves to take over. So we don't have to worry about giraffes. <clears throat> so now let's take a look at the vascular supply of these different regions. And of course, as I'm talking about these things, you're thinking about ways that this can result in damage. Uh, so impairment of vagus nerve in the neck uh, can potentially result in uh, paralysis of the vocal cords, uh, which could mean that the vocal cords are paralyzed, closed, which means the person's airway is closed. So, uh, you know, 
this uh, a cyanotic individual, this is something you have to be aware about in an acute setting. Uh, is this person going to need to be intubated because they are incapable of opening their vocal cords? Uh, so uh, if it only happens uh, unilaterally, then the person's voice is going to be hoarse and, and terrible. Uh, but anyway, moving on to the vascular supply. You see here, we've already talked about when, in the neck lecture, the superior thyroid artery. It gives off a, a superior laryngeal branch that travels with the internal uh, laryngeal nerve uh, and gives off a cricothyroid artery branch that travels to the cricothyroid muscle uh, and continues down to supply uh, the superior portion of the uh, thyroid gland. The uh, inferior portion of the vocal cord is supplied by the internal laryngeal artery, internal laryngeal heading uh, inferior there. Um, I, may have, I may have misspoke earlier. I, I think I may have said internal laryngeal artery traveling through the thyrohyoid membrane. So if I did, uh, this, is, this is correct. So fix your notes. <clears throat> uh, so now let's look at some things that can go wrong with the voice box. So polyps are a, um, something that can, are transient things that can happen uh, that develop along the vocal fold on the edge of it. Usually benign, usually goes away. Uh, so hoarseness, uh, breathiness, so might block or um, prevent the vocal cords from closing. Um, uh, so this is usually due to abuse of the vocal cords. So if you've been to you know, your, your college football game and you were yelling, go, 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 make the touchdown, roo, rah, rah, and whatever, and you were yelling too loudly, the next day your voice is all hoarse, probably because you've torn up the mucosa over your, uh, your uh, vocal folds and create and a polyp is formed, starting to form. And so with time, uh, this can, can go away. Or, uh, you know, this can be particularly troubling for professional uh, vocalists, uh, musicians. Uh, so this is something, uh, sometimes a, a professional musician might even get surgery to remove those uh, so that they can perform uh, more quickly. Uh, so things like that. Now, some uh, other problems, tumors. Uh, tumors can close off the uh, vocal folds or cause um, irregularities in the vocal folds, uh, which will uh, result in a similar hoarseness. So using this laryngoscope, uh, these tumors can be observed and you can see these lumps on the uh, vocal cords and on the um, uh, the, uh, like the, um, uh, medial, uh, glossoepiglottic, uh, fold here in the midline attaching to the tongue. And so those can occlude the airway to a degree. <clears throat> now what happens with paralysis? So uh, I, I recommend you take a look at these videos here. You have the PowerPoint slides, so you should just be able to copy and paste or click on them. So when the uh, vagus nerve is blocked, that can result in paralysis of the vocal folds. Bilateral paralysis uh, means a compromised airway. The patient can't breathe. Unilateral paralysis is going to be a weak, breathy voice because um, the patient isn't going to be able to control the opening of those vocal cords and can result in problems with swallowing because swallowing, one of the mechanisms, is to close the vocal cords during swallowing as a fail-safe. If, if things get past the epiglottic cartilage, uh, then this is a fail-safe. But without that, uh, then you know things can enter the airway and, and the patient can develop pneumonia in the lungs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what else, what else to say about this? Um, I had something else to say, I think. Okay, I can't, I can't, I can't think of it at the moment. Um, so anyway, it must not have been important. So now let's talk about, uh, other signs. So, oh yes. So, um, the vagus nerve can be impaired in many locations causing these issues. Vagus nerve can be impaired as it's descending uh, down the neck or can also be impaired as it's ascending around the arch of the aorta. So um, one of the signs of 
uh, an aortic arch aneurysm or problems in the aortic arch, irregular formation, is going to be breathiness and a hoarseness of breath uh, because the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, on that left side loops down under the arch of the aorta and an aneurysm there or an infection uh, or anything in that area is going to pull on or damage the nerve, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, as it arches under the aorta. So pay attention to the various places where the vagus nerve can be impaired and how that vagus nerve impairment is going to, um, you know, uh, be due to various other uh, symptoms, issues, problems in the patient. So it's not just as straightforward as a oh, vagus nerve, you know, blah, blah, blah. It can be a, a consequence of another condition. So another sign of vagus nerve impairment at, the, um, at an earlier port, uh, uh, point, like at the jugular foramen, is going to be the elevation of the uvula. So vagus nerve is uh, elevating that palate, levator veli palatini, and in that process, uh, it, it pulls the um, pulls the palate uh, to one side laterally. So, uh, for instance, if there's a unilateral lesion of the uh, vagus nerve, then the pa the uvula will deviate to one side, and the uvula deviates to the unaffected side, away from the affected side. So here we're seeing levator veli palatini pulling the uvula up to the patient's left side. So that means the right side is flaccid and the right side, the vagus nerve is impaired. So you can see that. Here's an actual picture of that happening. You can see the uvula uh, being pulled to the patient's right side. So the left side is flaccid, uh, meaning the left vagus nerve is impaired prior to its innervation of levator veli palatini. So uh, that's all I have for the pharynx and larynx. Uh, this is the end of 6-1. Thanks for watching.